Hello, this is Jake Abbott, and today we're going to be talking about uh, an introduction to linear systems, the type of systems that we're going to be talking about throughout the semester in this state-based controls class. Uh, to begin, let's just think about a really simple uh, black box kind of system as inputs and outputs, and, and you've probably seen systems like this in other classes. So we have some sort of, I'm just going to draw a black box, and I'll just say black box system. So it's some sort of system, we don't really know what's going on inside of it, but we have the ability to control inputs to it. So we're going to, in this class, we're going to call these inputs U. And and so what is an input? An input is something that you have control over. So it could be a voltage that's coming out of a DA card on your computer. It could be a knob that you turn. But you, as some sort of like human user, have the ability to set that thing. You have absolute control over it. That's what defines it as an input. Then your system has some outputs. And in this class, we call these outputs Y, typically. And what is an output? Well, an output is any signal that's of interest to you, some signal that you want to track as it evolves in time. It could be the position of a rocket. It could be the velocity of a rocket. It could be a voltage across a capacitor. It could be the speed of a saw blade. It could be the position of a robot arm. It's whatever thing it is that you are interested in observing. That defines it as an output. And so for any given system, there aren't hard outputs because the output can change based on what you're interested in looking at at that period of time. The inputs are relatively fixed because those are the things you have control over. For your system, you'll know the things you have control over and the things you don't have absolute control over. So in previous classes, systems that you've considered have probably been of this form where you have one input and one output. And in this class, we refer to those as single input, single output systems. And we typically call those SISO systems, single input, single output. And in this class, we're actually going to consider the case where you have multiple inputs and multiple outputs. So we're going to start considering MIMO systems, multiple input, multiple output. And so let's say for the system, instead of having one input, we have three inputs. And instead of having one output, we have two outputs. These are completely arbitrary numbers I'm picking. And so in this case, now, we have to think of this as sort of signal one as an input, and signal two, and signal three. Now, these are all scalar inputs, so it's a scalar variable that's changing as a function of time. And we can think of this as y1 of t and y2 of t. And we can always do this. We can always think of having scalar inputs and scalar outputs. And then we're just going to pack these together. And so we're going to refer to this thing not as a scalar, but as a vector. And in a textbook, they can use bold for vectors, but I can't do that easily. So I'm going to use a little arrowhead to refer to these as vectors. But we're going to talk about, in general, for MIMO systems, multi-input, multi-output systems, we're going to talk about a vector input u and a vector output y with the understanding that that can have sort of n things in it. So this is going to be some, in this case, this is a 3 by one vector, and this is a 2 by one vector. And so just always remember when you see this input u of t, what that really is encapsulating is something like this, where it's a bunch of scalar variables, u1, u2, and u3 of time. And this is a shorthand notation we use that in general can have multiple things. Now, there's nothing special about the number three or two or one for that instance. So in this class, we're going to consider general multi-input, multi-output systems. But but one one input or one output is a completely valid number because we're going to consider general numbers. So it's not like we're not considering single input, single output. We're just handling it more generally. And so if you're given a system that has one output or one input or both one, one input and output, the mathematics that we do just handle that seamlessly. But you don't have to make special considerations for it. So we now have a system with inputs and outputs. And it's some sort of black box system. We don't really know what's happening inside. Um, and we define what an input is, the thing we have control over. We know what an output is, it's the thing we're interested in analyzing. So there are going to be um, certain systems, very simple systems that we'll very rarely consider, where the output y is only a function of the input u at any given instant in time. So imagine I have some instant in time tau, okay? And so this could be like, let's say, at five seconds, at five second point. I want to see what is y at this instant tau. What is y at five seconds? If it's possible for me to know that by only looking at u at five seconds, we can call this a memory memoryless system. So if y at tau is some function of u at tau, and it's only a function of u of tau. So I don't really need to know what the input was in the past. I don't need to know what it is in the future. If you tell me what the input is right now, I'll tell you what output is. This is called memoryless. And there are systems that are like this. Like, consider a resistor. So what's the equation for a resistor? I have some resistor with resistance R, and I apply some voltage across it, V. And due to that voltage, I have some current that flows I. And there's an equation, V equals I times R. And let's say the thing I have control over is V. So by definition, for my case, U is equal to V, because I have control over voltage. And let's say the signal I'm interested in looking at is current. So by definition, the output is current. So I can rewrite this equation as current equals V over R. And so I now have an input-output relationship that maps my input voltage to my output current. And at any given instant in time, and these are signals that are evolving in time. Voltage I can change in time, and the current will change in time. The resistance is constant. But at any given instant in time, I just uh, command a voltage at some tau, and I can immediately know what the current is. It doesn't matter what I was doing in the past. So this is an example of a memory memoryless system. The thing is, memoryless systems are quite boring, and most of the interesting systems that we're going to consider are not memoryless. They actually have some sort of memory in them. And so for systems like that, we have to somehow, inside of this black box, hidden in there, there's something that we call a state. And in general, this state's going to be a vector. Now, we're going to allow that it to be a one-by-one uh, one vector, so it could be a scalar, but in general, it'll be some vector. And we'll call this the state of the system. And so the question is, what is the state of the system? The state of the system, it, it has a strict definition, and your textbook will give you that definition. It's the state of the system is a system that says, if I know everything in my state, so I know all of these variables about my system, and I know the input, then I can uniquely predict the output. And so let's think about that more specifically here. So let me first just kind of write down basically what this is. So the state x at some time 0 of the system is the thing that if I take the state x at time 0, and I know my input vector u of t, and I know my u input t for all, so we know this symbol for all, it looks like a little kind of compass. So this is the symbol for all t greater than or equal to time 0. So like, let's just boil down what we're looking at here. We have an input signal that we know. We don't really know what it was before time 0, necessarily, but we know what it is at time 0 and for all time forward. So starting right now, I start my, my, my input is voltage, I start controlling it, and I can know what it is for all time, and I perfectly know that thing. And then I know this state, and we're sort of um, defining this in a sort of circular way. So the state exists, and if I know it, these two things together, well, let me know what my output signal is, y of t, for all time, 
greater than or equal to D0. So it's basically kind of think that the state has a minimal amount of extra knowledge about what's happening inside that black box to be able to predict the output. It's not good enough because our system is memoryless. It's not good enough to only know the input. Somehow you have to know something about what's going on in that in, inside that black box, and the state is kind of the minimal amount of knowledge we need to do that. And we have physical intuition for systems like this. This, this idea of state, I mean, we look at a resistor and the voltage and current going through this resistor as a memoryless system. But let's think of a system that we can really wrap our heads around easily that has memory. And I think a really easy example is imagine a mass. So you've got some some mass, some cube m, and it's flying through space at some velocity v. And let's say that v is our output. That's our thing we're interested in. So y is equal to v. So it's flying through space, but we have this idea intuitively of inertia, right? There's, this, this mass has some momentum that's equal to m times v, and it has this inertia, and it doesn't want to slow down or speed up easily. So if I have a force, let's say, that's my input, so u in this case is equal to f. So I have some force that I can apply, and if I just ask you very intuitively, if I apply one newton force, at that instant I apply one newton force, what will the velocity be? And if this mass is already hurtling through space at a thousand miles an hour, and I apply one newton force, the velocity that's going to result from that is going to be maybe a little tiny bit faster than what it was already going, which is hurtling to the right. If it were at a dead stop and I apply the same one newton force, I'm gonna, the resulting velocity is going to be some really small velocity. So clearly, there, it isn't good enough to just know what the force is. If you're interested in the velocity, it's not good enough to just know the force. You also need to know, well, how fast is the mass already going? And so this is the sort of intuitive idea of state. So clearly, the, the velocity of the, of the system is somehow important to know. And so if you look back up here, you'd say, okay, yeah, I, I kind of get it now. If I know the velocity already at time zero, and I know what the force that I apply from starting now and forever, then I can predict the velocity, how the velocity will kind of evolve in the future. So we have this intuitive notion that somehow, there is extra information needed besides just the system input, and that's this intuitive idea of state of the system. So in this class, we're going to be looking at a very specific kind of form of systems. And these are systems that can be modeled by sets of first-order differential equations. And in a different video, I'll explain how to take systems and model those systems as sets of first-order differential equations. But here's ultimately what we're talking about here. We're going to look at equations that are of this form. We're going to have some state vector. And, and, and this, we'll typically call this vector x, but just remember x isn't important in any way. And if for some reason you have a problem where you want to use x to mean something else, you can use any variable for your state. It could be a z, or it's completely arbitrary. But here's the basic state space form. It typically is written with in exactly these variables that I'm writing. So we have this, this state vector, x, and it's a, it's a set of signals evolving in time. And what we're going to do is we're going to use this dot to mean the time derivative of those signals. And so we're going to say that x dot is equal to a x plus b u. And so in general, we're going to be talking about an n by one state vector. And if I take the time derivative of n by one vector, I still just get an n by one vector. And we're going to be talking about a p by one input vector. So the idea is that you don't have to have the same number of inputs and states. Those are totally arbitrary numbers. And we are using, again, uh, we use lowercase letters in this class to mean scalars. We use lowercase letters with a vector bar to mean vectors. And we're going to use capital letters to mean matrices. And so this, this matrix A is going to be an n by n thing. And you kind of know that that has to be the case because if I take an n by one thing and times it by this, I'm going to, that's going to be equal to another n by one thing. So just by dimensions from linear algebra, you know this has to be an n by n thing because these two n's here have to match each other in center. And then you, an n by n times an n by one thing give you another n by one thing. And by that same logic, you can know about this. So this, this thing here is going to be n by one. But if this thing and this thing are adding, then this thing, you already know in advance, this thing has to be also an n by one thing. And so you know this matrix B has to be an n by p matrix. So we're going to be looking at sets of linear differential equations that are of this form, x dot equals ax plus bu. And really what we're talking about here is we're saying, okay, I have a state, and the state of my system fully describes kind of where my system is at any given point in time. And what we're really saying here, here is in this equation is how are my states evolving in time? And that's what x dot is telling you. So how are my states evolving in time? Well, they're they're evolving based on what their current value is somehow, and that's mapping through this matrix A. And then they're also evolving based on what your inputs are. So both my inputs and my current state define how my states evolve. So that's what this equation is telling us. And then we're also going to have this equation y of t is equal to some matrix C times x of t plus b times u of t. So again, x is an n by one thing, and u is a p by one thing. That hasn't changed. And then how many outputs are we now? Let's say we have q outputs. So let's say let's say y is q by one vector. Sorry, I didn't draw a vector bar. So I have q outputs. I have n states. I have p inputs. Well then, you know, just based on the same way here, we have to take an n by one thing and an n by one thing and add them together and give us an n by one thing. We know these things have to be q by one. So this thing here has to be a q by one vector. So we know the c, ma the c matrix must be a q by n matrix. Same thing here. We know this thing has to be a q by one. So this b matrix is going to be a q by p matrix. So this equation now says, okay, we have some states in our system, and they're evolving as a function of the current states and the current inputs, and then we're going to have some output signals. And in general, we are going to say these output signals can be sort of any combination of our states and our inputs. So, and like I said before, the outputs are really just the things that we're interested in looking at. And we can change those if we want. We can say for some system, well, I, I'm, right now I'm interested in looking at the position of my system. And later we can say, I'm interested in looking at the velocity of my system. But because this is multi-app, multi we don't even have to choose. We can have, we can say, I want to look at the, both the position and velocity and the force and have all of those outputs come out. We can have a three by one output vector. So we can just make our outputs do whatever, whatever combination of states and inputs we want to look at. And you can even think about looking at additions of them. We can say, I want one output to be the position and the velocity added together in my system. I don't know why you want to do that, but it's, it's a possibility with this kind of structure. So this structure here is what we refer to as the state space form. And this is the form of equations that we are going to be looking at mostly in this class. Now, in general, I've actually written a subset of the state-based form. I've, I've looked here at a linear time invariant system. 
time variant. And what does time variant mean? It means my system isn't changing in time. Now, of course, my system is evolving in that my input signals change, my states change, and my outputs change. So there are other signals that are dynamically changing. But my system itself, so these are things like resistances and masses and the things that sort of make my system what it is. These hard things that are locked in these matrices A, B, C, and D. Those things are not changing in time. Those are static. And this is the system that we're going to spend most of the time in this class thinking about. It turns out that many systems can be modeled accurately like this, and we know a ton about these systems. We basically know everything there is to know about these systems. And throughout this semester, You'll learn how to characterize systems that look like this, how to describe their stability or instability, how to describe their dynamic response, how to talk about is it possible to control them, is it possible to understand what's happening in the state by only looking at the outputs. You know everything there is to know about this system, and that's what we're going to be mostly talking about. So we're going to be talking about linear time variant or the LTI systems. Now, in general, you can rewrite these equations where you write A as a function of time, and B as a function of time, and C as a function of time. And and those systems we call linear time varying systems. They can still be linear, and in a moment here we're going to talk about what it means to be a linear system. So uh, that we will spend some amount of time this semester talking about linear time varying systems. They're more difficult to analyze, but they're also more rare. I mean, if, if we believe that these, these matrices A, B, C, and D lock up things about our system like mass and, and voltage, or excuse me, resistances and capacitances, then you'd have to ask yourself, why would those things be changing in time? And you can imagine scenarios where they would. I mean, imagine you have some uh, some mass out in the, in the freezing winter, and over time it's uh, pulling ice. So as time goes on, it's like your mass is getting heavier and heavier. That would be a case where you'd want time varying um, system. But these are kind of kind of rare cases to imagine, and most of the time we actually can't think about linear time invariant systems. So that's most what we're going to be spending time here and with. And I, and I want you to remember the whole time that this is a shorthand notation. These are vectors. So in reality, you know, when we look at this equation, x dot, like this, of t, remember that's something that looks like this, right? x1 of t. And now these are scalar things inside of here. x2 of t, dot, dot, dot. There's n of these things. And that's equal to some big matrix, some big A matrix. That's an n by n thing, right? Full of scalars. a11 to a1n to a uh, n1 to a nn, right? Dot, 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 dot. And so these are, big, these are big matrix operations that are happening. I don't want you to forget that. That's an n by one thing, and this is an n by one thing. And so the one thing you'll notice about this matrix, it's n by n. In general, the B matrix, the C matrix, the D matrix, they're kind of rectangles. But the A matrix, it's always a square. It's always a square matrix. And it's because it's mapping the state vector to the state vector dot. So it's almost like it's kind of mapping something to something that looks very much like itself. So the A matrix is always a square thing. And that's an important function here because in linear algebra, we know a lot about how to analyze square matrices. And we know a little less about analyzing rectangular matrices. So the fact that it's square is going to be a very powerful thing for us. So let's move on now and talk a little bit about what it means for a system to be linear. Why do we use this term linear? Um, linear systems are things that that uh, are found in lots of mathematical analysis of systems, but specifically in the case of, of these state space forms, what does it mean to be linear? Well, a linear system has, has really two properties. A linear system means that I have an additivity property, and I also have a homogeneity property. Oh, excuse me, that's a, I just stole that. So we have a linear system has an additivity plus a homogeneity property. And it actually has both of these things simultaneously. And so when you think about these things together, we sometimes call that a superposition property. Superposition. So what does additivity and homogeneity mean? So in the, in the context of, of this state space, here's additivity. Additivity. So additivity says this. It says, I have some system that has some state, let's call it x1, at time 0. And it has some input, and let's call that input set u1. And this is u1 of t that's defined for all t greater than or equal to time 0. And he said that by knowing the state and by knowing the input from time 0 on, that's enough to fully define the output. And let's define this output that results from this. So I, I started the state that I call x1, I give this input that I call u1, and some output results. And let's call that output that results y1. And this y, y1 of t is for all time greater than or equal to t0. So if I would have started my system at a different state, if I would have started it at x2, and I would have given it a different input signal, u2, or t greater than or equal to t0, if I would have done that, I would have gotten a different output signal. And that output signal that I get out, let's call that y2, right? That makes sense. So this happens. I start at different states, and I get different inputs, and what happens is I get different output signals. Now, what the additivity property says is this. It says, if I would have started my state at this value, x3 times 0, equal to x1 plus x2. So let's say I did that. I started my state at this x3. And let's say I gave it this input signal, u of t. And that u of t signal happened to be equal to the input signal 1 plus the input signal 2. And this is for t greater than or equal to t0. So let's say I would have done this. I started my state here, and I gave this input signal here. Well, what will result is an output that we call y of 3. And it turned out that this y of 3 will equal the output signal y1 plus the output signal y2. This is the additivity property. And you can't take for granted that this always exists. This is a property of linear systems, that I can sort of watch my system do one thing, and then watch it do another thing. And then I can actually say the I want to do a third thing, and that third thing is simply the exact sum of the first two things it did. It's like it's almost like you can break your system up into chunks and watch the chunks, and then watch your system as a whole, and the sum of the parts is equal to the, the parts. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a funny way of thinking about it, but, but this is effectively what the additivity property says. And in general, systems don't follow the additivity property, but linear systems do. And then what's the homogeneity property? So homogeneity. So the homogeneity property says, if I give my system here some, some initial state, x1, t0, and I give it some input, u1 of t, for t greater than or equal to t0, then some output, y1 of t, will result. Then it says, if I come along here and all I do is I take my initial state, the same state as x1, but I just multiply it by some constant, alpha. And then I take my same input signal, u1, and I multiply my input signal by that same constant, alpha. Well, what's going to result is I'm going to get an output signal that looks just like my original y1 of t, but it's also multiplied by alpha. This is a homogeneity property. And basically, you kind of think of it as, you know, if I give my system some input and I watch its response and I make my input twice as big, then my response will be twice as big. It's, that's kind of how you can think about homogeneity. So, and then a linear system is both meeting the 
additivity property and the homogeneity property. And so you get this kind of cool superposition that you can actually kind of, um, if you want, almost kind of forget about the additivity and homogeneity property and just remember it as one big kind of super property. And you can sort of say, you know, if I give my, if I give my system some uh, alpha times x1 um, at t0 plus some beta times x2 at t0. So, so sort of any combination I say, I can have some initial state uh, times by some scalar and then some different initial state times by some different scalar. And then I have my input be some u1 times that scalar plus some different u2 times, times a different scalar of this, then the output that results will be alpha times y1 of t plus beta times y2 of t, where y1 would have been the output signal that would have resulted from x1 u1, and y2 would have been the output signal that resulted from x2 u2. So if you can do any combination of the additivity and homogeneity property mixed together. So um, this is going to be a really powerful result for us in thinking about, in thinking about uh, state space control systems. Um, and the reason that is is because we can sort of decouple our way of thinking about how our system responds to inputs as a zero state response and a zero input response. So oops, sorry. if uh, the initial state x at t0 um, is equal to 0, a 0 vector now. So we have a state, let's say it's a 3 by 1 vector, and all three of those states start at 0. So we set this thing equal to 0, and we call the output y of t. So this is just sort of definition. So if this is true, we call this output y of t the, the 0 state response. Zs, y is the 0 state response. And so this is just something that's going to evolve. So basically all we've done is we've said we have x at t0 equals the 0 vector, and we have our inputs u of t being whatever they are. It doesn't even matter then the thing that we're going to get out of this is the zero state response for all t greater than or equal to t0. So this is just a definition. We have this, um, if, if the state at the beginning of time is zero, then the, the output that results is we call that the zero state response. And the same thing goes that if we say u is identically equal to zero, the zero vector for all time, so t greater than or equal to t0. So we're just going to leave the input completely off. So we basically have, we have x at t0 is something. It's not zero, it's some state. And we have our u of t equal to the zero vector. The output that results from that, we call that the zero input response. So it's a pretty simple notion, but because of this uh, this linearity of systems, we can actually say, you know, we can always say, let's take some arbitrary initial state x. Well, we can write that as well. That's just I can write that as that same exact vector plus the zero vector, right? Anything plus zero is equal to itself. So that's just a statement of fact. And then I have some arbitrary u of t. Well, I'll do the same exact trick, but just reverse it. So zero plus u of t. So I just wrote this, and that's no big deal here. But if you group these together, you see that this grouping here, so some initial some initial condition and the zero input, that's what we just described right here. So this is the zero input case, and then this block here is what we had described up above, and so that's the zero state case. So I have some completely arbitrary initial condition state, and I have some completely arbitrary input, and what's going to result from that is some y, some y of t. But the y of t always is always equal to the zero input response plus the zero state response. So for any system, any system, no matter where you start it, no matter what you do to it, you will observe an output y, and that output y will be, you can think of it as decomposed into two signals. A signal that would have happened if I had given it no input, but started it at the state I started it. Plus another signal that is if I would have had given it input, but started it at a zero state vector. I mean, this is a pretty fascinating thing, and it's always true of all systems that we're going to look at. So it's a very powerful result in that way.